Well, if there's anything that Christians like to do best, it's to complain about modernity. We don't like modernity. We wish modernity would go away. We find everything that's associated with modernism to be bad, bad, very bad, and the opposite of good. Now, the point I'm about to make is uh, not going to be particularly new to any fans of Mark's YouTube channel, Navigating Patterns, uh, but I do think it, it bears repeating today. This category that we had, that we have of modernism is not a good category. It's intrinsically confusing and slippery. So if we look in the dictionary, we'll find that uh, modern in modern English means now existing or of pertaining to present or recent times. Now, the problem with trying to use this chronological category to refer to stable realities is that time just keeps on ticking, ticking, ticking into the future. And what was modern at one point is now outdated and no longer relevant. What is modern keeps on changing because our experience of time as material creatures, as human beings, only goes one direction. And until uh, I see the DeLorean with the flux capacitor in it, I'm not going to believe anything else. This is how things are. So, so maybe you don't believe me. Maybe you think, oh, I think it's still a, uh, a uh, perfectly useful category. Well, next time you're reading something or you're listening to someone speak, every time they say modernism, replace it mentally with todayism. Replace it mentally with todayism. Ah, yes, uh, that 16th century was the beginning of the today period. Was it now? My goodness, you certainly have a very different experience of time than I do. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we what we find in todayity is, is it going to be different tomorrow? See, when we use this basket category of modernity, we're including different things underneath that. And whichever one it is that you want to complain about, complain about that one particularly. So I think a lot of times when people are talking about modernism or modernity, the thing they really want to complain about is some form of materialism. They want to complain about a reductive materialism, or they want to complain about a scientific materialism. Well, complain about that specifically. Talk about how bad of an idea, thinking that all of reality is just a bunch of electrons scooting past each other is. That's precise. That's an idea that isn't going to slip away on you. Or maybe they complain about how the viewpoint of people today is limited only to this world. They might call that modernity. We'll complain about secularity then, of only thinking of the age and not thinking of the forever. Complain about that specifically, and that category won't get away from you. Or maybe they want to complain about ugly art. Just call it ugly art. I don't care when it was made. I don't know. I don't care what era it belongs to. If it's ugly, it's ugly. And the odds of it ever becoming beautiful are not, um, are not good, are not good. So as a rule, go ahead and avoid the category of modernism, which is no different than saying todayism. Speaking about 17th century todayism is ridiculous. Speaking about 19th century scientific todayism is absurd. But there is one place, one category, where I will allow you 
to speak about modernity. Uh, okay, here we go. Where I will encourage you to do this. And that is in the realm of theology. In the realm of theology, I will go ahead and encourage you to talk about modernism. Now, why is that? Why would that be? Well, it is actually a useful category in theology because it describes kind of a movement in theology in the late 19th century. What was going on was people were making the argument that the Catholic Church needed to update its doctrines, needed to update its timeless dogmas, needed to decide not to be stuck in the past anymore, but to be moving on into the future. And the argument that they made is that our personal experience of theology is more important than perennial patterns, than time-tested doctrines, than the authority of the church. And that on account of my experience of theology, I should be allowed to update these things. And that's actually a decent use of this word modernity. It was, it was well named by uh, St. Pius X when he condemned this as an error and as a heresy. Because that is ultimately this idea that what's happening today should change things that are uh, supposed to be forever. Things that are supposed to last for a while. That can all be changed based on what we are seeing today. And so when you hear in the context of theology, people talking about modernism, it's not necessarily bad framing. It's not necessarily a bad category. That's people who want to judge the things of heaven, perennial patterns by the things of today. So it is a form of todayism and it's condemned as a heresy uh, by the church. So. That's what I think about modernism. Um, just a quick announcement. Next stream will be Monday, April 1st at 10 a.m. Central. How you doing, Casey? Good. You brought up modernism, and I just started chewing on this book, actually. So I think, I mean, he gets into the relevant issues, obviously. Like, mm -hmm. belief in the world today is the start of the book. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's good framing for how modernism is. Thinking that the way we think now is more important than like things that have lasted for centuries. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, that describes uh it describes many things. That's why didn't didn't he call it modernism as the synthesis of all heresies? Right. He did. He did. And um, yeah, yeah. It uh, it was especially because. So uh, when Pius X um, condemned the heresy of modernism, he did it with kind of three, it was like a three-legged stool. He had this idea of immanentism, that our experience of God, of the faith, should actually be what is normative. So that's, that's kind of the first thing. It's kind of like the most powerful thing because you had this experience of the divine, you know, and like you, it makes you uh, re, uh, rethink the way you live. The second part of it was agnosticism, this idea that we could never come to a uh, final question about things regarding God. Uh, revelation would always be open, always open to further interpretation. So we couldn't ever have the final answer there. And the third is um, uh, third is uh, evolutionism, the idea that uh, the church's doctrine uh, can evolve on certain things, that it can change and morph and go from at one point A to another point not A. As opposed to my understanding is basically it's made more clear over the years as opposed to like anything new mm -hmm, mm -hmm. being, you know, like we're 
like we're digging up something new and fresh. And like, mm -hmm. this is our new doctrine here. And it's like, no, the, the, the doctrine's eternal, but you know, you can you can see it more clearly, let's say. Yeah, yeah. And what was implicit in one age might become explicit as time goes on. Wonderful. And uh, <laughs> yeah, good night. That guy, uh, I caught him in time, but uh, there was nothing good coming after that. So, but he's on the band list now. So anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna let thanks for uh, being on the internet. I'm gonna let things cool off a little bit before I post the link again. So you might just have to uh, to remind me if you want on. People are crazy, man. People are crazy. Ah, uh, alrighty. Let's, uh, Mark. You know how to let yourself in. Um, <laughs> yeah, we share a Streamyard account. That's how you know you're really close. Yeah, we were There's, talking about. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. People crazy confirmed. That's for sure. So, Casey. How was uh, Palm Sunday? Uh, cool. I went to the solemn procession. Nice. And uh, Palm Sunday is always interesting, just because like it's the long, it's pretty much the longest mass of like the whole year, um, except for maybe the Easter Vigil, I guess, right? Easter Vigil would usually be longer, but it's it's the longest one that is going to have a big crowd at it. So I don't know how you do it at your parish but for the passion reading we had like three readers or something basically is that how you guys do it too okay it's extremely common i have three readers and then everybody has the pew missiles open in front of them and they do the crowd parts yeah and so that comes from a tradition where if you were chanting the passion narrative on palm sunday uh or on good friday uh you would have in Rome, anyway, they would always have three deacons, one doing the narrator part, one doing the part of Christ, and one doing the other voice. And then the choir would answer with the uh, the crowd parts. Okay. Um, and they still do it that way in Rome. Um, but the uh, after the uh, revisions, after the Second Vatican Council, they... Um, they um, it was just the way it developed in the United States was to 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 read it in this way, which is not that far from the way it was being done. But if you can hear it chanted rather than just spoken, I think that's really special. Chanting makes all religious texts five thousand percent more interesting. The, the one of the priests in my parish, he's like a newer priest. Mm -hmm. He got ordained in twenty twenty, and uh, he said he just that's his favorite part of some masses is just being able to chant the whole thing. So yeah. Yeah. It would be really cool to see that. Keep yeah. Keeping it past his bedtime. Watch out. It is past my bedtime. You got me until another 10 minutes or so. Okay. Well, <laughs> sleep is important, especially if you're a working man. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I took your ideas and put some fancy uh, packaging on them. But that I todayism am, no. thing is just really. I'm thrilled. That was great. That was really brilliant. I like it. I'm, uh, I'm so what did fan. you think of my talk on uh, on the uh, on the heresy? Uh, I, the heresy of modernism. I, once I heard that, I'm like, how come every time I dig into these things, there's like actual like Satan at the bottom of it, or 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 somebody stated, yeah, this is evil, or or so. Every single thing I dig into, I'm like, really, this is getting a little weird coincidence wise. It's almost as if when I listened to, I didn't hear the whole thing, but I listened to the first probably 55 minutes of Jordan Peterson and destiny. And, um, I, I know I can't, I can't, I could not, I will not ask well, yeah. Mark about it. Well, well, it's, it's nice to hear somebody who's actually just factually incorrect and could just look it up and know that and just be wrong about absolutely everything he says. I'm like, that's, that's impressive, dude. Like you've got every fact you're bringing to bear wrong. Every single one. <laughs> and to watch it, yeah, it's it's crazy, but, but you can't two, do that on accident either. Well, that's the thing, right? It's it's something's going on. But two interesting things happen in that first fifty-five minutes or so. Um, one is uh, Jordan Peterson basically uh, lists what what some people call egregore, right? You and I would call spirit for sure. Um, 
and calls that out. And in the other one, he talks about satanic possession. And and they're they're only a few minutes apart, but I was like, yes, that's exactly. And he, he like outlines it. He's like, well, I don't know. You see all these things that they're doing, and they all sort of have the same end result. And I'm kind of thinking maybe they're moved by something else. It's like, yes. Which in my uh, draft of the essay that I, I sent you about uh, Dr. Peterson, he's right on the edge of materialism, right? And he's like, really? yeah. well, nobody bloody well knows what's going on out there, but it sure is strange. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I think that's his, that, like, that's where he should be and you should never leave. You've, you've said that before. It's not yeah. really up to me. Um, but you've, I, you've, you've said that plenty of times. So I agree. I'm just saying that's like a good place for him. Maybe, maybe it's not, maybe it's not as good for him personally as, as it could be, uh, but maybe it's the best for the world. And maybe that's a sacrifice that has to happen. I don't know. I'm just saying it's worth considering. That's why, mm. that's why we have these dog headed books. Have that dog headed right. books available. Soon, soon. Available I, soon, coming soon. The, we the tale go, of the dog headed. We got to travel for Easter and then, uh, and then we'll get back. We got 500 of those. So I got to, I got to do something with them. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, wherever dog headed books are sold. Well, uh, that I'm trying to get them as part of, uh, Peugeot's press there, but maybe they don't need or want them, which, which is totally fine. But I, I was trying to get in touch with Richard Rowland and he's, you know, at the summit, he's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, DM me on Twitter. I can't. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> can't DM him. You've, yeah. And for, you know, whatever reason, there's all kinds of security settings. Um, I'm not blocked or anything. Well, I mean, I, I think his, his signal went way up after that, just because yeah. he really showed up and it was awesome. And I was there for it. So yeah, it was great. It was great. Yeah. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping I'll hear back from him, you know, just after Easter at the latest, and then, and then that it won't be, be Easter good. yet for him. But uh, this yeah, is we'll like see. this is crazy because um, Orthodox Easter isn't until like the end of April. Oh, really? Oh, it's like know. really, um, really way off. It's uh, that stupid Julian calendar. See, this is why you need a pope, so the pope could just be like, "Hey, guys, new calendar just dropped. We're using it now." Right. You need a really great Pope. Or even just a mediocre one can pull that one off. They give you a new calendar? I don't know. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, you just got the right mathematicians on board. And uh, it's amazing. In the, uh, at the old Vatican Observatory, they had like a room without any windows so that they could track the motion of the sun across the floor. But they, mm. you know, they're Italian, right? So they painted the wall and they had like this angel with its mouth open. And that was the hole through which the sun came and showed down. Uh, so it's, you know, I mean, it was Renaissance art, but uh, it was still pretty good. And uh, I like the thought. I like the energy behind, you know, the angel uh, bringing the light in. Um, yeah. So anyway. So would you recommend people listen to Peterson versus Destiny? No. Okay. I <laughs> cannot I, I wouldn't recommend. think you would. I'm shocked. I'm shocked. No, it just I, I mean the problem is you need to like there is enough people in the comments that are clearly fooled and think like Peterson's angry. He's never angry. So, but he gets shocked. He's like, Wait, did you say something that stupid? <laughs> Although he doesn't say that, but you can that's the that's the type of shock. And people are going, he got angry. And I'm like, that's actually not anger. And I think part of, we'll say, the loss of the poetic information in the world is people can't tell emotion from tone anymore. And so they confuse things like passion for anger or things like shock for anger. Because, he, I mean, he's genuinely shocked, right? Because Destiny, Destiny at one point says, uh, well, I, don't, I don't think that, that redistribution was one of the problems with communism. And of course, Peter, like, like, right. And at this point, you expect Peterson to just explode, right? Because, like, he talks about the kulaks. Like, mm -hmm, what mm -hmm. did you think that was? Mm -hmm. You know, and he, I mean, he's very gracious about it, but he, like, his voice gets like, what? Excuse me? What did you say? It's not, but it's not anger. It's like just complete shock 
Like, have you never heard a word I've said, sir? <laughs> right. And then, Apparently and not. Then, he was too busy playing video games. Right. Right. Well, you're, right. He's never listened to it. all these people do that. They don't. They don't do their research, and it's just. It's just atrocious. They're just. Uh, and, they're just like an open field that anything can be planted in. Right. You're right. going to get weeds. You're going to get weeds. That's what's going to happen. Right. But you but cleared but, out but, the native grass. It's just weeds is going to grow there. But that loss of skill, right? In the same way that people. Like maybe maybe today on Twitter, still don't understand why the word modernism is not a good word to use, and therefore postmodernism, which was even worse. Oh, right, it's like word. after todayism. So we're talking about tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrowism. Meta modern. Right. It's Meta todayism. <laughs> Meta todayism. Right. Which is worse because that doesn't even mean what comes next. It means outside. So meta modern could technically mean before modern. Technically, because it's just out everything outside of. It's like you guys are just throwing around words and squashing words together, and you have no idea what you're saying. I'm tomorrow with Sally on this one. We need to believe in the Church of Tomorrow. <laughs> wow. Who wants to be content with today, but we could have tomorrow. Exactly. We'll seize tomorrow today. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and it is that it is it is weird to me. So I, so I think if you watch it, you're not going to notice Destiny making all the mistakes he's accusing Peterson of. There there was one great moment too that I saw that was was so good. So at one point, Destiny goes, "What definition of leftism leftism are you using?" And Peterson plays plays from the same deck I play with and a lot of this stuff. And he goes, "The one you listed earlier in the conversation." And of course, Destiny doesn't remember defining leftism, but he did, right? Because oh, he's not that not smart. Good. Oh, no, that's uh, not. They never remember what they say. They never do. They, they, if, if you're making it up on the fly, of course you don't. Yeah, you can't. And that's he makes everything up on the fly. He just grabs facts that he thinks are correct, and, and usually his facts are wrong too. And then he puts them together in inappropriate, illogical ways, and then says, "And therefore," and. Like and he's constantly going like you're confusing weather for climate and then going yeah but we've had four years in a row of of global warming and I'm like dude you're the one that said that Peterson's confusing weather and climate here you are doing it like I don't think people will notice we need, that we need like thirty years to establish a a reliable trend right right but but it's funny too because Peterson points out well they put the temperature monitors inside of cities or just outside of cities and then the cities grew. So they're really inside of cities. And, and I'm like, yeah, guys, aside from all that, you're collecting much more temperature. And guess what? You've changed the measurement. And guess what else they did? Like, the, the, the climate thing is endless for me because I actually did research it. So like, I know I know all the tricks they're using. They They revised down the old temperatures that were measured with mercury thermometers in favor of the new temperatures measured with digital thermometers, which we know have a huge variance margin of error. Huge. It's right, because small. that works on a bimetallic strip, doesn't it? Well, it, it works on a digital measuring device that's doing a sampling against an unstable in temperature and time item. And so... The problem is if you 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 need to control for one of the two and you can't control for either with the new thermometers. And you know this because all you have to do is take one of these digital thermometers. I have one right here. Like you just take this and you move it to another room. And the thing is, if you have another thermometer, like if you have two of these and they're, they'll, they'll be one degree off usually, right? But if you move them both, the variance between them will change, okay? So what that means, and it's a simple test, right? It sounds too simple. You'd think the big smart people would know this. Well, they usually do, but they just don't tell anybody. So what that means is that the variance is too high for it to be used as a stable measuring device. That's what it means. And so if it's not a stable measuring device, because when the, if, if you use a bimetallic strip and you estimate, because you have to, how quickly the temperature changes, if you do that, you still have to, you have to be right, you have to update how often you measure. They have to match in a in a in a reasonable ratio. Otherwise, the temperature readings fluctuate unstably or are just way out of whack. They can be out of whack by three degrees. 
like this this thing is out of whack by at least three and that's degrees. three degrees in freedom units not in communist units exactly yes so that's, 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 that's what those uh, letters mean right yeah mm -hmm. yes but you see it doesn't it, it it's funny too like it doesn't matter that that the temperatures are off even they're not stable and so year on year for the same day, they could be three degrees off and maybe the temperature's not going up at all. And it's just, there's no way to tell. Right. And then, so if you revise down the stable thing, which is, you know, mercury, very stable, right. Then what you've done is you've corrupted all the good data <laughs> and substituted all the bad data. That sounds like a problem to me, but I'm just a priest. So I don't know it's anything about data. It's a problem of science and, and data manipulation. And, and yeah, he was saying also, oh, yeah, you know, the economists can predict the stock market because, you know, if you invest in the S&P, it's going to go up 7% per year. And I'm like, an average is not a prediction. And anybody who's ever done any trading knows this. An average is not a prediction. In fact, well, using an well, average as a predictor is dangerous. If anybody could predict the stock market, Eventually, that would break the stock market as a speculative enterprise, it, right? It manipulates the stock market. Yeah. A lot of people have predicted pieces of the stock market, but the minute you do, then a lot of people point this out. The minute you use a system that works, it changes the market such that your system breaks almost immediately if you overuse it. And knowing that, so now, now we're into a specialty of mine, knowing that is virtually impossible. It's very, it's not impossible. It can be done. You have to know a lot, though. You have to really understand the market dynamics at a level that, first of all, economists aren't aware of. Good to know. Uh, and, and is impossible. But it's weird it, it, because that problem is everywhere, right? Where we post hoc rationalization, which is what an average is. An average is a post hoc rationalization of a move through time, right? Whether it's a five day average or a five month average or a five year average, right? Confusing that for something about the future or or being predictive. It's post hoc means it already happened and then you looked at it. Predictive means it hasn't happened and you're making you're making a, a prognostication, a guess about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And he did that a lot. Like he did that with the climate. So, well, you know, if you look at I, I think he said it was uh, uh, 150 year chunks of of uh, temperature movement. Then you you see this vast temperature. First of all, that's absolutely one thousand percent false. Just just right off the bat, that's wrong. What he's saying is wrong. Uh, but second of all, yes, if you average any average, smooths the numbers, right? And Nassim Taleb does a great job of this in Fooled and by. That's Rand. what averages are supposed to do. That's what they're supposed to do, right? They're supposed yeah. to remove the variance. And so you can't say the average is this and the variance is this, and therefore there's a problem. Because you're talking about two different numbers that have no correlation or connection whatsoever. In other mm -hmm. words, the variance can affect the average, but you don't know how, right? Uh, but also, the average doesn't affect the variance at all. It's a one-way relationship. Yep, 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 yep. That Very asymmetrical. Sense. Well, so here's he's... the real question, Mark. Mm. When is it going to be navigating patterns versus destiny? That's the showdown I want to see. I'd completely annihilate him. Be so unfair. I know, and I'd, be, and I'd, ha I'd have a bucket of popcorn. It would be great. I am tempt him. I'd love to just eviscerate Sam Harris publicly. It'd be glorious. But see, I, I can already tell. Like just thinking about it, my brain's too happy. Shouldn't do that. Shouldn't, Shouldn't do, do it. That. We wouldn't no. want you to be too happy. You would lose I'm your not, edge. I'm not saying. I'm not saying that I wouldn't. I'm just saying I shouldn't. <laughs> Okay. It would okay. be glorious. It would, but, it would it would it would be like me destroying Claire Koch. And I was just I was happy for days after that. I was so thrilled. I'm like, oh, this is my favorite game, and I never lose this game. It's you're so the awesome. monster with four left arms. We should make you happy. As long as you're punching the right things. That's I, his that's yeah. Mark's nickname, by the way. He's the monster with four left arms. I gave it to him. So he didn't make it up himself. It's yeah, it's, it's bestowed not, it's by not me. My that it's, name. That, it's, that it's, a, it's a legitimate nickname. He didn't make it up. Unlike Destiny, go. that's a made up nickname right there. There's a made up name. Also, it's weird to me that people don't listen to him and immediately realize he's a little more effeminate than uh, maybe a male of the species should be. Because I can just hear it. Like, it's not even, it's not just his tone because he has that nasally, whiny voice. 
uh, to me, but it's also the way he talks. It's very soft edges and he rounds out his words and yeah, like everything about him. I'm just like, so it's that more of a addiction weak. than a, uh, it's both. It's all of it. There's well, like, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna judge a guy for the vocal cords he was handed. He right? wasn't, he wasn't though. That's the thing. But if it's if it's a matter of the way you speak and you could affect it, it could be different. Then that no, actually he, tells you something. No, no. I, I actually, see, this is this is really interesting. I gotta I gotta do one of these days. I'll publish this course. But uh, like you can you can you can deepen your voice just through a normal practice, and all that normal practice does is effectively train your confidence level. It trains oh, your level. Oh, that's what Margaret Thatcher down. did. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's what I mean. Apparently There's no she reason had a very for any girly man. voice and she got into politics and it wasn't working. And so she got a voice coach and it became the lady is not for turning. Exactly. So so you can do it. So I do blame people because I'm like, you can change that. It's actually not that hard. It's well known. It's well researched. Uh, I can give you a simple method for doing it that like takes no no effort, requires no extra special anything and not a problem. But he doesn't want to. <laughs> It'd be interesting to get him angry to see if he can be angry because he just sounds like a passionless wet noodle. Oh, really? Okay. He, no, got, he, really he got Trent Horn. So I, I've never listened to Destiny talk even for like a minute. But he had this this debate on abortion with Trent Horn. Trent Horn is a Catholic professional oh. arguer. He's he's one of the two best, I'd say, him and Jimmy Aiken. They're both real solid. And mm -hmm. Trent Horn is known for just being like, you know, super positive all the time and really polite and friendly and welcoming. And by about an hour into this debate with Destiny, he just looks at him and says, you're insane. You're insane. And he, he yells it at it. He's clear. He's just lost his mind because that, that told me everything I needed to know. That's funny. <laughs> I didn't finish that one. I just couldn't. Listen to Destiny. The, the, my problem was keep, people keep saying, oh, I had a debate with Destiny. And then they don't follow the debate format. And I'm like, dude, if you're going to have a debate, have a debate. And if you're not going to have a debate, don't call it a debate because, like, you know. That's... Is that with a moderator and time limits? Is that a debate? Yeah. Yes. Yes. But the minimum for a debate, you don't need need a moderator, technically. I mean, technic kind of technically, if you want a, a formal debate, you need a moderator. But if you want an informal debate, all you actually need is two people taking a stand and then defending the, their positions. So they actually have to articulate their positions rather than just talking. Destiny never articulated a position in the piece of that thing that I listened to with Trent Horn. He mm -hmm. didn't do yeah. it. What he did was he can say, well, and he actually says, see, this is what I mean by you shouldn't watch the guy because for some reason he enchants people and they miss very obvious errors that he makes, right? He he said, "Well, I imagine that if you're against uh, if you're against abortion, your position is." And he outlines a straw man position and then fought that in the debate. And I was like, "Why is anybody allowing this to happen?" Right, because he needs to. He, if your destiny, sorry about that, you have to say why abortion is good, basically. Exactly. You have to defend, you have to state your position and defend it. That's what a debate is. You state your position and you defend it. And a, a typical trick of these people, particularly like this, on the for some reason, uh, most of them seem to be on the left. Weird, random coincidence. The world is not equal and smooth and symmetrical. So it had to be one or the other, right? They, they will not take positions on things. They flat out refuse. So would the first and, half hour of the Mark Destiny debate just be you trying to get him to take a position? No, no, no. I just wait for him to say something and say you're wrong, and here's why. And 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 see, this is what I think people are missing. When someone's wrong, you need to stop them immediately. You need to. It's not optional. I know you're gonna piss them off. Whatever. I don't care. You have to, because they will enchant the audience, and you will lose the opportunity to fix the audience. Forget about them. Who cares? Right. If you're doing a public debate, it's not about the guy across the table. It's about the point you're trying to make. And so your job is to is to protect the audience from bad ideas. And on both sides, like, look, I don't I don't know whose idea is going to win. Right. But that means when somebody makes a false. See it, Casey. When somebody makes a false statement, you have to stop them immediately and then ask them the simple question. And it is a simple question. 
where did you get your information from? How much research did you do? What white papers did you read? What experts did you do? What books did you read? That's all you have to do. Why? Because zero, actually zero of these people have ever done any research. Zero. And I know this because when they talk about these issues, which I have researched, I know what the research says and it doesn't say what they say. It's really that simple, right? Most people are lazy and they don't do the work. And instead, they'll, you know, and, and always in Twitter wars about this stuff, they'll quote somebody else. And I'm like, dude, you could literally just go read the paper. Here it is. You could go read it yourself. You don't need some person in the government or some historian telling you something. You, you could look it up yourself and know for sure that what I'm saying is correct or wrong, right? It's correct, by the way, because I actually did the research, but whatever, right? You could just do that, but they never do. Right. But, but then and... the question is, why do you believe that you know something that you've never researched? Mm -hmm. Because that's the way in the age of gnosis, which I'm a little disappointed you didn't mention. That's the correct frame, framing for modernity, what people are using it for. In the age of gnosis, that's the highest value is what you know. Okay, how do you know what you know? And that, that's when their world comes crumbling down, which is good for them. Like you, you, you've got to be able to push back on people and let them know when they're wrong. Oh, and so all of this indicates the necessity if you're going to be properly grounded in the world and let's say navigate it well the necessity for beginning in a state place of humility right. of um you know it reminds me there was this famous letter uh that saint thomas aquinas uh wrote to somebody he wrote back to somebody it was some like punk kid who was just starting off at the university and he's like hey what do I need to know, right? And he's like, well, basically what you have to do is you have to start small, get the fundamentals done well, uh, not go after things that you're uh, uh, not ready for, and uh, basically follow the plan that's laid out for you. And, uh, you know, if you, if you do it like that, um, rather than just trying to become important, uh, things will go well for you. Um, and that's actually not nearly as easy as just coming up with something on the fly to defend that position that you just kind of intuitively right. grasp at because it's convenient for you. Uh, it's actually a lot more work to go in and be like, huh, this guy's saying this, and I don't even know what I think about it. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Well, in the age of Gnosis, we don't want to have the position of ignorance because then we're valueless. Because the only valuable thing is knowledge. That's why it's the age of gnosis. And then once you see the pattern, it's like, oh, 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 you know, and 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 yeah, there's some link. I haven't quite figured it out, but I did notice it on Twitter today, actually. There's some link between that and the and the arrogance, the inability to admit when you transgressed. And I don't really understand what that is. I mean, I think I think maybe that's the sin, right? To not know. Or to know and be wrong is a sin. And so they won't go. Like I got I got uh, an ad hominem attack. And I just basically very nicely pointed it out to the guys. Well, your, your ad hominem attack means you're right. Or something, you know, something equally cheeky about that. And then he responded with this whole excuse that the, 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 the subject of the conversation had shifted. And he apologized for not noticing that or something. Or he, he didn't even apologize. He said, maybe, maybe I'm bad at that. And I said, all right. Maybe your word salad means nothing and you're not actually communicating <laughs> because you get, there was this word salad first. And then I said, and maybe just acknowledging the transgression would be a good idea. Good for you. You know, like, I, I don't care. Literally, you're, you're a bunch of texts on Twitter. I just can't care about that. Sorry, I can't. Um, but it would be good for you to acknowledge that what I said about the ad hominem attack, which you clearly, you know, launched, uh, was a bad thing. Like you just say like, oh, I did this. Okay, that would be a good for you. It's good for your soul. It didn't do anything for me. I don't care. Like you just hear your opinion of me or really anything is beyond meaningless to me. <laughs> like, That's why we make people do confession when they're young. Yeah, yeah, get used yeah. To get it. them in the habit. I confess that I'm a muppet. Sorry. Amen. There you go. There you go. That's a, that's a good habit to get into. Confess your muppetry. 
fetch it, man. It's like, what do you, what? that's a really funny thing, right? Is, and I've, I've been here before, right? Where like you're, you're standing in line for the confessional and you're just kind of embarrassed to be there, right? Mm. Along with everybody else who's there for the exact same thing, to go to confession. Inside of the church, where you will regularly hear the priests talk about how useful it is to go to confession. It's like, come on, man. Like, everybody's doing it. It's actually really normal and healthy, and the people who are in trouble are the ones who refuse to come here. So, like... right. It, but I, I, I've seen it in me, right? I'm not just pointing at other mm. people. It's like this has been in me too. That uh, that shame can keep you from uh, shame in the wrong spot. There's things you should be ashamed right. of, but it's it it needs to it needs to be where it belongs, right? And that's well, why and, we've and got you, the soundproof box. And you have a you have a backlash effect too, where now people just confess inappropriately in public forums all the i'm always shocked i'm always all i like every day practically i see somebody confess something that i'm like dude let's suppose what you're saying is true and accurate which you know you know you you, you know you did it i wouldn't tell anybody that <laughs> not in public i might right. not tell my best friend that particular thing i think i'd leave that one to myself Right. It's like there are plenty of things that you, you YouTube people don't hear about me because I'd save it for confession, right? It's like you get this public slice of me so that we can have a society where people can live. Right. Well, and, and you can exemplify something more than 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 the whole of you, right? Or, or present your best face. Like it's weird because on the one hand, people want like, no, I want the whole authentic you like right at me. I'm like, yeah, you definitely don't want that. Um but but on the other hand, they're like, oh, but you know, you want to bring your best self. And it's like, you do realize that's a contradiction, right? And they don't it, it, yeah, because obviously you're great because you could sit down in front of Dr. Jordan Peterson and just make things up and you'll win and everybody will clap and think that you're just wonderful, and they'll see what an awful, you know, first off, he's not really that smart, and second off, he's just a gateway to the alt-right, and yeah, third yeah. off, I have blue hair, so I win. Yeah. It, it was it was really remarkable to me to listen, especially on climate. I'm like, dude, I the, the hardcore climate people have already admitted that's a lie. I don't know what to tell you about that. Like, you know, crazy. Oh, you the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere correlates to temperature. Actually, it does not. <laughs> not even close. I was like, well, I don't, I don't know where you think you read that, but let me explain something to you, son. It well, absolutely he's got a line graph. He's got a line graph in his head. And carbon goes up, and temperature goes up. Obviously, that's how those two things are related. Obviously, obviously, you gotta highlight this. This this don't this comment one? here. Yeah, one of the worst things ever said is if you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. Thank you, Don. Yeah, that is a worst thing. That is the worst thing to say. And and not in all situations. Live your best life now. Oh, yeah, how to live your best life now. No, wow. how to live your best life in modernism. <laughs> oh, Same oh. statement. Oh. Yeah, it's your stream, dude. Like, that's you a, that's, that box. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of the problems with this little corner of the internet, right? The the what with the Peterson sphere? What Peterson sphere, yeah. I, go I was that was never mind for Pete's sake. What are we even talking about here? All righty, here's the real question Why is there snow now? We didn't have any snow in February, now we got you snow got, on the ground. You got snow too. Yeah. Sally Joe's been complaining about it, so she probably got more than we did, but like. <clears throat> I don't know. Oh, this is good. Gage Murphy Ooh. noticing a lot of it is if it's not public, it's not real is an underlying assumption. Unfortunately, it it is. It, so and I haven't exactly seen this part yet, although Sally Joe tells me uh, that that it's in the Destiny Peterson conversation. There's a big and, it, and, and you've seen it elsewhere, right? There's this big move towards if, you know, the majority sees it, then it's real. And I talked about that on my live stream on Friday, actually, this democratization idea. Where it's like, well, if enough people see it, then it correlates to reality 100%. 
And it's like, uh, that's definitely not how that works. You, you need some, you need you some church readings, boy, or or any wisdom text, because they it's it's weird to me. They were like, you know, we need East and West to be. I'm like, dude, read the books. They actually say exact same thing. Like, there's no. There's literally zero variance. I don't know what to tell you. Well, this should be another age of gnosis thing, right? Yeah. If nobody is. knows this, then it doesn't matter. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, exactly. Well, and the more people that know it, the more important it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This correspondence theory stuff is weird to me. I'm like, I don't, I don't understand why people get, why people are like that. But you're right. It's a good, it's a good spot. See, this is why age of gnosis is so handy because it's like. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, there's some age of gnosis there, and there's a little more there, and yeah, it, it really helps. I got to get on the articles. My next, I got all the, I got a, a single swipe at all the transcripts on my YouTube videos now, so I have them all. Finally, yeah, don't try to do that programmatically because it it's nearly impossible. Apparently, don't worry if I if I I'll 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 pay you to do it. Um, yeah, yeah, you can do that. Absolutely, I'll. Absolutely, I have a method now. It takes a little bit of time, but it's it's not it's not bad. Um, I haven't checked. The, I'm in the process of checking them to see how good they are. Um, and I, but I got to get my tweets so that I can do my age of gnosis stuff. That's been holding up my age of gnosis argue, um, article. Has been held up for by Peterson's not being able fear, to get my for Peterson's fear dot com, right? That's going to be for my Substack. For your Substack, I've got an article for Peterson's fear dot com, which I cannot understand why i keep forgetting to post it but i actually just need to post the damn thing well Brain. you know uh i've put the link back because i think the uh i think the trolls are gone so the link has Hopefully. been restored to its rightful spot um yeah that video that that guy showed was pretty disturbing i'm glad i got to it in time um yeah that was weird yeah well you know he had a demon so that's <laughs> just what happens to people is they get possessed by demons so um Possession if somebody else comes Satan. in Possession by Satan. Peterson mentioned possession by Satan effectively. He didn't use Satan. But right. Whatever. He did it in his Gnostic framework. It's not new for him. But, but it's, good that, it's good that someone's pointing that out. It's like, why did you do that? You don't know why you did that. You're being driven by a force outside yourself to do horrible things on streams. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. It, uh, it, it is worth saying. So anyway, the, uh, the links back up, um, Mark and I can talk for hours. It's about two thirds Mark, one third me normally. Um, but uh, this is the open mic, so uh, I'll put it uh, put it out there. Uh, Hopefully, we can get somebody else in here. I, I I I gotta highlight this. Ixnan. Obviously, the climate gets worse when there are less pirates, which shows how much Mark cares about the environment on navigating patterns. Thank you. That is hundred percent. Can confirm. Can confirm. All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's science, basically. You did the measurements. <laughs> it's science. You did the measurements. You trust the science. The number of pirates has gone down. Global temperatures have gone up. I I don't know what else to tell you. The correlation since the right pirate there. age, the global temperatures have definitely gone up. So ah, oh, there we yeah. go. Excellent. Well, how you doing, Emma? Hello. I thought I'd help. Appreciate Thank it. You. Appreciate it. Uh, how was Palm Sunday Mass? It was good. It was actually, it was only like 20 minutes longer than regular mass, which was an impressive feat. Well, the uh, the Roman Missal, right, because I'm a nerd, I actually read it. The Roman Missal <laughs> says a a short homily may be given or uh, they may observe silence. So it's actually oh, right. optional. You can actually skip the homily. You can on, actually uh, skip the homily. Um, Palm Sunday. I, I, I do think it's worthwhile to to say a little something. Uh, but no, actually, I think... had a pretty solid homily. Um, father didn't realize, didn't he said he didn't start to feel rushed until right before like the Eucharistic prayer, and so he decided to go with Eucharistic prayer too, so that he didn't feel like he had to rush through. You know, I've never, as a main celebrant, chosen Eucharistic prayer too. <laughs> Not even once. It's all one and three. I'm sure that shocks you. <laughs> Startled the altar boy with that one. Okay, this guy sounds like he's all right, but really, you plan on having a two-minute homily on Palm Sunday, uh, and then because Mark, I'll, I'll explain this to you, Mark, because mm -hmm. you've probably never been to Palm Sunday Mass. It's a week before Easter every year, and um, if you're doing it right, 
which we had to modify a little bit because of all the stinking snow on the ground. Uh, you start mm. in some place other than the church, and then everybody has palm branches. And so the bishop goes around and he blesses all the palm branches. It was the bishop today. I, I am seen for the bishop today, but a, a normal priest can do it too. The priest goes around and he blesses the palm branches and he sprinkles uh, them with holy water, which is very important. And then um, you read the gospel of Jesus's triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And then what do you do? We all march into the church. Mm, that would have been nice. We should have. Mm. You had the that solemn entrance. Really fun. You had the solemn entrance. So the first, there's three forms. There's the solemn entrance, or the uh, the uh, procession, which is what I just described. And we just did that from the basement up into the church because of snow. Snow. Um, and then there's a solemn entrance where he does that just with everybody in their seats. And then, we did that one. Yeah. Which is, uh, yeah. Fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. But Emma's just a little disappointed that she didn't get to do it. I am a little disappointed because I like processions. Who doesn't like processions? Everybody boring should people. Like Very boring people. Or maybe the yeah. people who have to organize them. Um, I, you know, that's fair. Because they are a lot of work, especially if you've got to get the police involved to like close down streets for you. Oh, like really big processions? Oh man. Oh yeah, yeah. Apparently, and, then, uh, and, and there's not only that, Mark, but then when you get to the um, the gospel reading, you do the entire passion narrative, which takes yep. a solid 15, 20 minutes in itself. Mm. And then you have the rest of mass, so it's uh, it's a big deal. But people come to this mass who don't come to church often because yeah. they, get, they get palms. They get like, stuff. Are they not aware that I can give them the Eucharist every time they come? Apparently that's not their big draw. I just, I, <sighs> I don't understand why you would go half these on Catholicism. It's like all or nothing. Obviously, right? Obviously because... it's all or nothing. <laughs> Someone's all yeah, in I here. think, I think for a lot of people, it's the emotional impact more than anything else. Like, that's mostly what they're judging by for things like this. Oh. I hope so. No, 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 no. The emotional modernism. impact of everyday Eucharist is lessened because it's there every week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people like novelty. That's another age of gnosis thing I haven't figured out. It's the novelty connection. Also, I'm going to have to go back and listen to what you actually had to say about modernism. Um, so so it's, modernity. Really, it's real easy, Emma. It's real easy. Except in theology, because it means something pretty specific and useful in theology. Uh, every time you hear somebody talk about modernism and modernity, just replace it with todayism. I will say that I do think there is a specific literary movement of modernism. And with specific characteristics. Talk about those characteristics instead. Yeah. Fair enough. That yep. was the whole There's... point was you can't use, you can't, this is the point of my video on, on the same subject. You can't use the term because the term basically always re means now. And it can't well, refer to the Yeah, I mean, my argument is that it's stupid to name your like literary movement or whatever after like, oh, it's the one that's happening now. Because someday right. the literary movement of today will be the literary movement of yesterday. And how stupid is that going to sound? And if right. you write a great book, high schoolers will be made to read it. Right. But the, but the more important part is the theological definition. Because the theological definition tells you why you shouldn't use that. Go ahead, Father Eric. Tell us the use case, actual use case. So modernism, condemned by Pope Pius X in the early 20th century. Uh, Immanentism, the idea that your experience of the faith should be normative, not something outside of you, but your in internal experience. Mm -hmm. Agnosticism, the idea that we can never come to a final question in any matter relating to God, a final answer to a question in any matter relating to God. And evolutionism, the idea that ch church doctrine can go from at one time being A to another time being not A. And so since it's... How often, how often do you think people have confuse the condemnation of evolutionism with the con condemnation of evolution all of the time 
Yeah, probably a hundred percent. That's so almost one hundred percent of the freaking time. Freaking annoying. But look, man, it's 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 not development; it's evolution. Evolution has changed from one thing to another. Bulbasaur isn't the same thing as Ivysaur. Everybody knows this, right? Right. Actually, that's probably an example of development, but never mind that. We don't know. We don't know because the Pokemon or they don't actually exist. Um, there you go. So yeah, that was that was that was the uh, the brief version with fewer uh, comical asides. So now you know. Now you're. Yeah. Hopefully, so, that so, knowledge is useful to you. So basically, using modernism is Satanism. Yeah, problem solved. I agree, hundred percent. Well, I see a lot of church people use the word modernism or modernity to complain about materialism. So just complain about materialism and, and yeah. you're in much better shape. Yeah, I've seen a lot of that too. Yeah, it's it's a weird arrogance to a Andrew's comment, which I just find hysterical. Uh, <laughs> been trying to hold back my laughter, Andrew. It's great. Um, but it's 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 a weird arrogance that sneaks in for the artists of any you know, type of art to, to use the term modernism. Like there's the mm -hmm. chronological snobbery right there. Like mm -hmm. what makes you think that like, cause you're basically stating you're at the end of architecture or art or literature. That's what you're stating. Not getting any better after this. Yeah. Well, and that's why now we're stuck with stupid words like postmodern and metamodern. Yeah. Which are really trying to stay yeah. in that frame and continue on past it. No, no, no. See, that's the trick. Oh, oh, oh. That's the trick, right? The second you start ceding the territory of today to somebody else, then they have it forever. Right. Right? Yeah. Because they'll always be modern. They'll always be up to date. And you've given that to them, right? Whereas I could just be like, listen, Sam Harris, you're basically just dealing with uh, 18th century materialism here. Like, you haven't progressed past that. Read, right. read that French guy's book man the machine that's what you believe is, is that the guy who thought that the ocean would become lemonade and we'd live I, in a utopia i that sounds that might amazing. have been older can you there can was, you look that up and get me that guy's name that's some i i i want to know more about this oh yeah this is one of my husband's favorite like crazy early economist stories uh and i can never remember the guy's actual name well, economics all began as commentary on the book of Genesis. Really? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, 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 on, a, on a conceptual level, not a, you know, nerd sitting down counting beans. Um, but uh, man in his primitive state and um, and kind of the, the, the notion of the universe in traditional exegesis, they would look at the Garden of Eden, um, and they would say, Adam lived in a place of plenty. There was an abundance of resources available to him. And the, the move you get with Hobbes and Locke, who predated Smith, I read a really smart article on this somewhere, so that's where I'm getting my information. Um, they said, well, actually, man uh, the universe is scarce and there aren't enough resources to go around and that's why there's conflict mm. and they actually did this in the context of you know because it was the 16th it was like the 17th century the bible was still everywhere um mm. and like they couldn't get away from it so that's how they made their argument and it like man noticed his scarcity and that was the fall from the garden My man Andrew, he gets it. So uh, uh, the modernist style was meant to be a style for all people, all time, um, and it doesn't actually work. Right? He's a good Catholic. You don't worry. Don't worry about him, Mark. He's going to be fine. No, no, I know. Yeah. But, but the heresy is in the use of the term because it's mm -hmm. an arrogant. It's an arrogant mm -hmm. term because it just implies there's no time. Yeah, and so whenever you actually use it, you're basically ceding the ground to anybody who says, "Well, yes, I am very modern." Like they get to they get to have the future now. So, yeah, yeah, it's really tricky, and we I think people didn't know. Like this is what I mean by don't watch Destiny and and Peterson unless you're really careful because you're not going to notice all the tricks. 
that Charles are going to be played on. Fourier. Charles Fourier believed that the ocean could be turned into lemonade. It had, let's see. Actually, I'll just paste the whole link because he found a whole like quote from it. I'm I'm um, I'm I'm pretty sure that the ocean is already lemonade. No, mm. you see, if if we change how the Earth's atmosphere works, then it will the snow will be a whole bunch of acid, which will make co combine with the salt in the ocean to make it taste like lemonade. I see. Well, that's the French for you. Yeah, this is I why believe the French also the guy who came up with the French. mathematically perfect number for like a civilization. Um need sugar. Like something like there are like two thousand one hundred and fifty-three types of personalities. So if you make a town with one of each of those personalities. This sounds more like an eccentric fellow Sorry, that you what? would invite to a party. Sorry, two of each, they have to make babies. It sounds like an eccentric fellow that you would invite to a party, not a real intellectual. <laughs> the it's, like, it's like inviting the local monarchist to a party. You know, he, he genuinely wants to put the Habsburger monarchs back in charge. Which I've got one of those. I'm not even going to say right. that's a bad idea, but it's not going to happen in my lifetime unless something very strange happens, and we'll know about it when we get to the other end of that. So, um, yeah, yeah, Charles, Charles Fourier, Fourier. was he a mathematician too? I've heard no. of like that's different a different guy. Fourier. The yeah. Fourier transformation is a different guy. Fourier yeah. transform. Yeah, that's big. Transform. Everything, everything you do on computers uses a, a Fourier transform. <laughs> everything. That's how you get from digital analog and, and back. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm there oversimpl are massively there oversimplifying. Are common passions but. that result in 810 types of character. So the ideal, like, group of humans would have 1,620. One of male and female of each of these kinds of character, because so that everything is perfectly balanced. And obviously, you know, it needs to be perfectly proportioned. It's right. not like you need right. one liter. No, it's all perfectly, perfectly even. And then they will live in a sphere. Literally, their bodies will make a sphere, and it will roll across a perfectly spherical planet, and it'll. Do regular rotate. And, I mean, that's where he's go. That's where that leads, right? Turning everything. Uh, that that didn't, that made a lot more sense in my head. I'm sorry about that. Oh, she's on? muted. Doesn't love us anymore. Emma, we can't hear you if you're talking. Um, maybe her thing went dead. I think there's something wrong with your Fourier transformations. Yeah, there's something wrong. Right. Oh, no, Fourier you're back. transforms are dead. Yeah, what? Yeah, she shut off her headset, which ran out of batteries, most likely. Oh, how sad. Maybe, maybe well, it was nice to have her. It was nice to have her while while, while she was here. Um, yeah, boy, Charles Charles Fourier, real intellectual. Uh, you could see all the flat world Gnosticism, age of Gnosis ridiculousness there. Right, right. It's all right there. I just disconnected and reconnected, and that usually fixes it. It did. It's frustrating how often that works. It kind of is. IT crowd had it right. Have you tried turning it off and then on again? Honestly, that's what I do with most technology things. And a lot of the time, it still works. It's and everybody acts like you know things about works. computers. But it's only funny because it works. Well, the actually, the funny part is the really smart computer guys, they can fix everything. When they can't fix things, that's what they do. And it almost always works. That's what makes it funny. That's why it's funny in one way to lay people. And it's 
way funnier to we people who actually know what we're doing because you're just like, yeah, we should have just started there. Yeah, that's what I was about to say when my headphones silenced. No me. way. <laughs> wow. Boy, do we have some juicy bits on that coming up. When are we oh going to do that talk, Father? I cannot wait. I just after Easter. <laughs> Well, I know after Easter, but you know, you got to get at him soon because he's going to be in Taiwan. Oh, why is he going to go to Taiwan? You got to scoop him up before he gets in Taiwan. Cause... All righty. I'll, I'll irritate him tomorrow so we can irritate him tomorrow. I got him. I got him yesterday. So I got a video with Adam coming out soon. Nice. Always worth watching anytime you see Mark and Adam together. It's peanut butter and jelly. It's Siskel and Ebert. It's exactly what you want. Wow, thank you. Emma, yeah. do you know who Siskel and Ebert are? No. Uh, that's what I thought. I only, I actually, by the time I could watch television, it was Ebert and Roper, but they were movie critics. It's what you listen to before you listen to The Critical Drinker. Yeah. Well, and, and also they almost always had opposing opinions. It was very, very binary left, right. I think uh, Ebert was generally the more uh, respected of the two, wasn't he? Yeah, he was the more conservative. Coincidence? You decide. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I like what. Uh, yeah, I like, I like what Sally's saying. That talk that Tammy did about feminism was amazing. What was the name of it? It was uh... Uh, somewhere in my notes, maybe. But I don't have it up top. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look it up right now. I'm. I had to open sixty two thousand files recently, so now I like don't know where anything is. Like just was, well, was that Janice Biamengo or was it someone else? It might have been. No. It... Yeah, Janice Fiamengo. Yep. Yeah, it was okay. Yeah. Yeah, but the interesting thing about that, she's another one, right? Like I was real supportive of femin femin uh, feminism until I actually researched it. Really. Oh, 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 that wasn't it. And then I did some I did some additional research and uh boy uh if I got some info for y'all <laughs> I cannot wait. I'm like wait a minute, what? Yeah, there's some really interesting stuff. Um I didn't I actually didn't like the title. I don't think delivered on the title, but um mm. The untold story of feminism is certainly interesting. I'm still digging too, because I, I just like, you know, just like I, I thought this was a bad thing. And then you dig into it and you're like, oh no, it's way worse than I could have imagined. It's like, wow. When have you ever dug into something and it's gotten better, Mark? To be fair, technology. The deeper you dig into technology, the better it gets. Because as because you go it down works. In, no, because as you go down in detail. Right when you get to the core, to the beginning of something, which only works in man-made things, <clears throat> hint, hint, um, it, they get more precise and accurate. Right. So, so when you, you know, when you start coding in in basic and and whatever, and then you find because there are flaws in in the language, you get all pissed off. But then as you dig down, you're like, oh, I want to code in something where there's no flaws, and so you dig down into, you know. Assembly? Down and down and down into deeper and deeper languages, and you get to like machine code, and it it just works better right? until you hit a flaw with the processor because there's always a freaking flaw with the process. It's it's almost as if Father Art gave you sit down. It's almost as if we live in a fallen world or something. Almost, almost. Uh -huh. But 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 at least there are fewer errors because obviously as you go up in layers of abstraction or as you scale up or however you want to say it because they're the same hint hint um, more errors are introduced necessary you can't get around that <laughs> it's like these people I use a consult for they're like we want to do more releases and I'm like you're gonna get more bugs I'm like no 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 we'll do more releases and get fewer bugs and I'm like it's mathematically impossible but hey if that's what you want to pay me to do I'll do whatever you want you're paying the bills. I'll, I'll give you whatever you want. It's not going to have the result you keep saying, but whatever. Yeah, it's it's the same thing. But as you go down in, in, in details on the menu, that's why video games are so appealing to people. Because once they peel them apart, that I, I think that's also 
this sort of new thinking. I think that might be why people are willing to watch other people play video games because I just can't even fathom how that's a thing. Destiny makes a, his living doing that, by the way. So it's just weird to me. Yeah. But the, the, it's, it's almost as if, it, you know, again, Age of Gnosis, if you get the secret knowledge from the good player, you know, then you'll have the detail needed to be the perfect game player for that game. I think that's something like what's going on, which is why people watch other people play, even though I think it's a terrible idea. Uh, I mean, I think it's a substitution. So, like, what are we what are we talking about? Sometimes, if I want to take a nap, I'll put on a speed run. Right, it's just yeah. interesting enough to keep my mind from wandering, but not so interesting that I'll stay awake for it. Perfect nap. And that sports does the same thing. Yeah, right. exactly. It's like watching a sports game. Shows, you don't care about but the, the thing much. is, is that the interruption of the ads always it doesn't work. And that's it's so 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 the speed right. So so it's like okay, you could probably relate to maybe that's a good. That's fine. I'm just doing it to take a break. Um, I think a lot of people put the exemplification of somebody who's really good at video games up like they hold up here's here's somebody who's really good and then you've got like the chat community and their discord server and the merchandise and then that's that's how they connect with people once you have that infrastructure but i've known people more than one that just randomly go through twitch and look for gamers to watch I guess and they they're probably not just... communal at all. They're not engaging the community, and they're and they're almost always watching games that they themselves could play because they own them. And I'm always like, why um... would you want? Like, it's it's look look. I'll watch a baseball game, a football game, a basketball game, a hockey game once in a while, whatever. I mean, I've I've been known to watch whole like every game in the season of 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 a sport or something. That's not that's not like out out of bounds for me or anything but like it there's no way that if somebody has tickets to one of those games that i wouldn't immediately want the tickets rather than the experience of 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 tv right but what you're saying when you own the game is i'd rather watch somebody else than do the work myself and first of all that to me is like a big red flag <laughs> Latino yeah. are all workers. So I mean that's it's just sort of like late stage entertainment culture right there. Mm, like we're getting we're getting to some really, really dark stuff where you've got a guy who's so messed up that he'd rather watch another man with his own wife than be in there himself. And yeah. It's, it's, I don't I don't know. I, I think a lot of it might be the infantilization of these people where they're basically children and and they just can't engage with so-called sophisticated forms of entertainment um, and or they feel like they're not ready yet. And so they're still in the watch phase because children go through that. Right. Children will will watch you for a long time before they try to cook or try to build something or, you know, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. Right. They'll watch you for a long time. And then like. You know, and, and kids are famous for this. So at one point they'll go like, "Can I drive?" I'm like, "What?" And then and then the parents are always shocked at how how much they know about it, even mm -hmm. if they can't do it. Watching like, so hard, right? But parents parents aren't paying attention to what their kids are watching in that mm -hmm. way, and nor should they be. Like, this is not a bad thing. Like, please please don't try to do that. That would be bad, right? They're, you don't actually need to pay attention well to every single thing your kid does. Right, you should you should just be paying attention to your kids' well being, right? That's yes, that's your that should be your concern, not not what they're what, how much they're paying attention to something in particular, right? Un unless it seems unhealthy or or whatever. But yeah, your your job is to protect them and and form them and tell them no a lot, uh, not not to you know not to study them as creatures to be observed in a lab so that you know what they're thinking. I think that's ridiculous. But, but that's, I think that's part of the problem is that, you know, when I see that, if I want to think of it in terms of patterns, which, yeah, duh, navigating patterns, um, then, then that's what I see. I see the pattern of a child, you know, who's not confident, um, but wants the experience. And so they'll take that 
sort of detached experience. I like I like Sally Joe's. Yeah, you know what? You out. called me out, and you're right. That is why I watch Elden Ring instead of playing it myself. Okay. But I, I don't have correct. a thousand hours to put into getting good at that game. It's not worth that much time. They should it have a plot. They should watching. have like a plot mode. Yes, if they had a plot mode, I would buy and play Elden Ring and all these other games. Like right. I'm not good at games. I don't have time to grind to become good at games because I'm right. busy doing other things with my life. Right. And so these are the options I'm left with. Yeah, maybe maybe video games are evil and don't engage, but yeah, I, I'm I'm totally with you. Yeah, I, I, you know, and 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 yeah, you always get into the why not both, and it's like, well, because time, energy, and tension are limited, and one of them is a waste of it, the other one is not. I, I think this idea of not wanting to encounter resistance. Yeah. There's right. really something to that. And and like yeah. I know that I've had more hours than I care to admit wasted on just content on YouTube. And I'm not even talking about something that could potentially be interesting or useful. I'm talking about like, you know. 10 bosses in video games that were really hard right it just right right and it's like the thing is is there's no resistance put up to that it's just it's just all very smooth and you can just get sucked into it and uh and it, it, it puts you in this kind of numb space where you don't have to think about anything else right and yeah that's that's a lot of things nowadays um yeah it's like it's yeah. like you're on twitter that gets you wound up and then you got to go calm down on youtube the speedballing we're, we're speedballing people's psyches that's what's going on yeah. here i think i think that's true and i think too i mean there's a there's a uh we'll say an inherent inherent danger in that right because i would associate that with infantilization as well right because you you want to give children low resistance ways to engage with the world that's roughly called play. Uh, you know, it's not it's not all of play, but it's part of the description of play. And I think that's that's a big part of it. And uh, yeah, I mean, look, I was watching earlier today. I was watching this guy repair a Commodore sixty four with an eighteen dollar oscilloscope. Now, it's really not. First of all, I suck at electronics for some reason. I can diagnose electronics really well without, but I can't do any of the troubleshooting. I just. Blah, blah, blah. Whatever, uh, which is odd because if it's above the electronic stage, I can tell you what's wrong. <laughs> and I and like I said, I can often go, oh yeah, that's a floating ground between these two parts. But I couldn't probe my way there with an with, with an oscilloscope for sure. Uh, so this this knowledge uh, is of zero use to me. <laughs> and I love the guy's channel, Adrian's Digital Basement. All he does is repair old computers. It's really funny. Um, but but yeah. You, you, there is a, and I think obviously, I think there's a utility to that sometimes, right? Because it's 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 vacation, it's relaxation, it's right. you know, it's right. all those things. You're right? you're you're unhooking the bowstring so that it doesn't get stretched out. Right, right, yeah. People don't don't account for that cyclicality, right? Where it's like, oh, the world, even the world though it happens to them literally every day. Right. Well, and we try to do away with it. What's your heater set to? You know, it's like, ah, mm. what's yeah. my heater? I, I don't because you heat your house. So you're not experiencing the the cooling and and heating during the day from from sunrise and sunset. Oh, I'm 100 percent. am. I have my my thermos thermometer, my thermostat set to 65 in North Dakota. There you go. With an east yeah. facing wow. window. I used to do mine at at 62. But uh, but uh, but I'll hail the I'll have the champ. Well, I can't do that anymore, unfortunately. That now it's seventy three, and I still get cold occasionally. So, I don't know what's up with that. But yeah, it it, it it you know when you don't experience any cyclicality or less cyclicality, then you 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 want you want the smooth and easy way. You want the no resistance, as Sally called it. I like that. Now rather getting than annoying. rather than the delight of the contrast of really hard work, and then enjoyment right exactly well and they don't appreciate that so yeah age john it's not age it's illness <laughs> believe me it's illness yeah that's one of the ways i know i'm doing well because i can you know i like 
I'll like walk outside when it's really cold and not even notice. I'll be like, oh, okay, we're not sick today. What like, couch is really cold nowadays? Well, look, okay, so I've had convertibles for years, right? I used to take the convertible out in uh, shorts and t-shirt at, 40, at 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And that didn't oh, man. bother me. Okay. I, I could I could be outside and working in shorts and t-shirt at about 35 degrees and that way I've I've been known to go out shoveling in shorts. It's not a problem. Um yeah, that I was really impervious to cold in particular. Yeah, in anything particular. under 10 degrees, that's not gonna work. Probably not. Well, but I but I'd start putting on layers at that point. But I, I was really impervious to temperature really really like people were just like what the hell and i wasn't the most impervious but like it, it just didn't bother me at all but but now it's yeah ever since the illness and and it is one of the markers i use to know oh i'm better i can do things today it's definitely one of the markers is you, you're not becoming a snake cold-blooded that's pretty much what happens yeah you should feel my hands when they go cold it's unbelievable people are like wait a minute it's 80 degrees. How are your hands stone cold? I'm like, that's uh, that's that's the Reno. It's, it's triggered by some immune system response. Well, it's probably good that you're uh, you're in the, in South Carolina then. It is. It is. Well, I like what Sally Joe says here too. Yeah, that I look. I got out today and used the chainsaw. So nice. I was nice. chainsawing away. Oh yeah, we cleared a bunch of a bunch of land. You wouldn't even recognize that land now. We got a long way to go, but. Made some progress today. I cut down probably about half a dozen little trees. So, and probably about 32,000 vines. I, I can't, I can't even explain to you how many vines there are back there. I'm like, I'm what amazed. Is going on? I, I would be amazed if anybody couldn't get their plants to grow in South Carolina. No, no, you have to actively do things to make sure things don't grow because. They will. It's nuts. How it's fast just fertile there. That's it's, just how that place is. It's insane. I remember. I remember. So I lived in South Carolina when I was a little kid. And I remember one year there was just like a ridiculous number of caterpillars mm. just swarming the trees and just like mowing them down. It was amazing. And, you know, I was a little kid, so I liked bugs back then. I don't like bugs now, but I liked bugs back then. I can't actually account for what changed. So so somebody explain that to me in the comments, and then I'll, I'll highlight it. Um, and I, I just have, you know, caterpillars crawling around all over the place. Um, yeah, because my parents didn't let me sit inside and play video games all day because they loved me. So I went outside and got bit by fire ants. Yes. Oh man, the ants down here. Holy crap. You'd be real careful around the ant mounds. Yeah. I um I like Sally. Sally is getting really good at this now. Resistance lets you know when you and nature are separate. So it, it tells you the boundary where you end and other things begin. Ha huh, Sally. <laughs> that was but the because, because thing. our entertainment has already been like chewed up and it's been made to be in a human level. We can just absorb it without any resistance. Right. Mm. Well, and it's equal to us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why people sort of migrate in video games to first person shooters. Right. Cause then they're equal to the character on the screen and it's all the same. And there's equality doctrine for you. You know, some people think it's, it's the souls likes that that's like, that's the top tier, but real gamers know that top tier gamers play Dwarf Fortress. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> I had a friend who was obsessed with Dwarf Fortress when I was in middle school. Wow, it's true. It's true. Ooh, and I see, was, Andrew, Andrew knows you didn't really play video games yet. And so he kept like explaining it to me and explaining what his dwarves were doing, and I was just. So lost, but interested. It was entertaining, but so confusing. Mm. And this was not the man you ended up marrying, huh? No, I didn't know the man I uh, I am married to yet. Yeah, so let that be a lesson to you. You know, Dwarf Fortress might not be the way. 
Although I did know. date the guy who bought me Portal for a while. I didn't end up marrying him, but I did date him. Interesting. Dwarf Fortress is the best, according to Ixnan. Wow, okay. Wow, we got Dwarf Fortress is uh, more popular than I would have thought. Well, uh, it just got personal like... Personal Vendetta Against Re Virtual World. Andrew you're gonna have... oh no. <laughs> no, you're gonna Andrew, have to... no. Run you're going to have to wait a little while. It really... Like, you want to talk about masculine spaces right there. Go to the Dwarf Sorcerer subreddit. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Not a, whole lot of, not a whole lot of femininity there. Okay, now I'm curious, but I'm filing that one away for after Holy Week. Because I'm doubling down on no social media. Uh, I, I've never actually been there. I Holy just Week. know. I can deduce... From a priori principles, what the That's Dwarf fair. Fortress subreddit is like. It's fair. They're all general. the scourge of Satan. Yeah, mm -hmm. all the uh, all the virtual worlds. It's all Hell a Japanese even. plot to uh, get back at Americans and steal our masculinity, but unfortunately, they weren't able to contain it, and it got set loose on their own population too. New conspiracy theory just dropped. <laughs> well, that's section of conspiracy. They hit the meaning crisis first because they accelerated our path because they took it seriously. You know, I'm actually going to say nice things about the Chinese Communist Party. They have like laws where young people aren't allowed to play more than four hours of video games a week. Yeah. Mm. And yeah. even I think that might be a little lenient. You know, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're on to something there for sure. Um, yeah, and 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 I do think that yeah, they're happy to watch all the other nations around them burn, <laughs> take over later. Very long, long thing. That that's one thing that we constantly underestimate with the uh, with the with the people of the East is the time frame. They are very long term thinkers, and because we are they're not a bunch not. of modernists, right? Probably, <laughs> yeah. Well, probably. and. Their civilizations, by and large, are older and have had more similar shapes for longer. Right, right. But 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 their 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 think their way of thinking. Read the geography of thought. I think it's Nisbet, right? Um, mm -hmm. it, 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 they just think differently. It's flat out. They just think different. That's why you can't take their their you know spiritual practices or philosophy, or whatever you want to call it, and just know it in the west you can't do that it's mm -hmm. not an option because you Remember, cannot think the way they do they can think the way we think but we can't think the way they think I remember, and it, this is well researched by the way very well researched i feel like you can oh go ahead go ahead i feel like you can see korea becoming less wedded to that way of thinking and moving more towards america in their television like when you watch Korean television. But they can they can switch ways of thinking and we can't. So they can I hope that's true, and I hope they're not losing it. No, I don't think they're losing it. I think they found a way to blend it because they're wicked smart. I hope so. No, no, I I I think I think when we so like Sailor Moon. So when you take Sailor Moon over from Japan into the United States. Nobody oh in the U.S. understands that Sailor Moon's a family show in Japan. I actually haven't seen Sailor Moon. Don't watch Sailor Moon. It's horrific. Uh, okay. It's like really bad. It's like, what the hell? This was on TV in Japan? Uh, but it's I've a family it's... show. I've heard it's a lot of things, yeah. Right, but, but the thing is... It, it's just something else. But we don't like we don't see that it appeals to three audiences. It, it appeals to the to the children, it appeals to the mother, and it appeals to the father at the same time. It also appeals mm. to the little boys and the little girls. I believe so because if they're very little, but at a certain okay. point, obviously, that's the boys. Because I remember being, you know, about six, and it came on the television. I was like, nope. Yeah, if you were six, yeah, you're probably over the um, 
<laughs> it's, it, it killed it, it sent him right out of camera forever uh, yeah if you were six it, it's probably over the threshold of finding babies cute yeah okay. mm. but but yeah because there's there's three different ways to read all the scenes and like we don't think that way <sighs> finally finally somebody who knows what they're talking about I know hello <laughs> <laughs> I love when I drop out of the conversation, then I get Father Eric's like cold opener for me, and it it's a little overwhelming. <laughs> Welcome, good to see you, sir. How you doing? Thanks. Good. Uh, yeah, very well. Just a uh, long Palm Sunday service this morning, which was lovely. Uh, it was like it was choir practice, and then being in the school it was like like three and a half hours of straight singing. It was pretty wild. Ouch. Um, wow. I'm yes. impressed you can still talk. You know, I have found that when we process and we're singing, that uh, my cognitive load is at like 103%. It's like everything that I can do to keep from tripping over my feet. If if Father had just taken us into the middle of the highway, I probably wouldn't have noticed. <laughs> I'm just like that focused on staying on my feet and, and staying, you know, on on pitch and in key and all that so but it it's lovely palm sunday is beautiful um it is it's always it always shocks me when for the blessing of the psalms when the when the priest comes in and he's wearing red it's like oh this is christ's martyrdom i don't know why like it's hard for me to to, to think about it in those terms is is somehow like shocks it back into pers into a little bit more perspective um so were you guys talking about Japanese culture and um, Im imported Japanese culture in the '90s? Is that what I thought I heard going on? Well, yeah, I was, I, I was. Yeah, I was going into more about the difference because the East thinks differently than we do, and they can yeah. switch. And like we get Sailor Moon, and we don't realize that's a family show in Japan because we can't conceive of a show that appeals to the three different members of the family at the same time for different reasons. Mm. Do they still we, have families in Japan when Sailor Moon came out? Uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. I mean, no, it's fair because they they hit the meaning crisis first. That was that was how it began. Like, yeah, yeah, Japan sort of hit the meaning crisis already, and we didn't notice. But they because they adopted our they adopted all the worst parts of our culture, like on amphetamines or something, and just like went full force into it. And and then you see that. Um, you know, reflected in their in their media and, and also in, in our reflections on them, right? You know, there's I, there's something weirdly, I, I've never thought about this until now, but weirdly parallel between like my perception, at least of Japan and Germany, actually, and that they're these like mo modern Germany and that they're these, um, they're so well organized materially, like on the material level, in terms of like, how clean are places? You know how um, how ordered is the architecture? How planned are things? You know how manicured is the landscape? Um, you know how well executed are public works projects and things like that? And I've never been to Japan. I have been to Germany. We've got we had a family from Germany, and so the first time I went to Peru, uh, I was there for three months, and then the first time I went to an adult to Germany as an adult was uh, a day and a half after I got back from Peru. So I went from the Andes oh, Mountains to, to Bavaria, and it was like the wildest whiplash. So one of the things that struck me is I saw a building in in Germany that was built out of like baked, you know, those like larger structural bricks. We don't really use those in the U.S. They look like cinder blocks, but they're red clay, and they're mortared together. And they use stuff like that. Like every building in Peru is built like that. And I remember, uh, what was the city? Puno. It was like. Well, you're standing up above the city and it looked like a picture from World War II because it looked like all the tops of the buildings are gone, not because they've been blown off by a bomb, but because they hadn't been finished. And it's just like pieces of rebar and half finished walls and everything because there's various cultural reasons for that. It makes more sense. But but also like when they, you know, the sides of buildings weren't usually finished and they just, there'd be like mortar just squashed out the sides and stuff. And like the bus system is, both extraordinarily chaotic and extraordinarily effective and so to go from that to germany where it's like 
seeing the houses built with the same material, but like millimeter precision on on the mortar. Like no, there's nothing extra. It's all perfectly clean. The buses are, are also very effective, but they're effective because they arrive down within like a 20 second interval. At any rate, all that to say, Germany struck me as this, it's like, or as my, as my brother put it when we were there, when you're starting to put in a second floor balcony for your cat, you've dealt with most of the major like physical problems in your country. All that to say, Japan, from what I've heard and the pictures that I see of it and all that strikes me as very similar. And yet there's this like sort of spiritual death that seems to hover over both of those countries. I mean, did your life become more or less efficient after you had children? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. When we, when we were talking about that earlier with the lack of cyclicality, right? Now you're out of sync with nature. Efficiency, almost any type of efficiency, and efficiency isn't a thing. It, it's got to be, you know, clearly framed because there's different ways to be efficient about everything. But efficiency as such removes cyclicality by definition. And so there's a trade-off there between how yeah. efficient you want to be, right, and, and how robust you want to be. This is one of the things that Nassim Taleb does a good job of talking about in his books is anti-fragility relies on changing of state. And efficiency relies on either no change of state, at least on a certain axis, or a very well-controlled change of state, usually that's very steady. And that goes back to Sally's yeah. earlier comment of no resistance, right? We're trying to yeah. live in this no yeah. resistance or low resistance world, but that's actually bad for us. It makes us fragile. It, yeah. So I just, uh, I'm almost finished with a read through um, Captain's Courageous by Rudyard Kipling. Have any of you read that ever? It, it's, it's, it gets a fun, it's boys book, basically this, you know, uh, late eight, it's like 1890s rich son of a, you know, everything American, everything tycoon who, you know, owns a quarter of the railroads in the U continental U S and all this other and mines and all sorts of stuff gets washed overboard in the grand banks off of Nova Scotia and picked up by a fishing trawler. And, you know, they don't believe any of his nonsense about being, you know, the son of a multimillionaire. And so he ends up spending the whole summer fishing with his crew. And it's it's very much like a coming of age. You know, he gets the snot beat out of him and actually knows how to like be a person. But I think there's a lot of connection there in terms of he, he uh, Harvey Cheney, the, the boy, right? At, as he has a, a low friction life, like in, in every single possible way, he has a, a low friction life. And like, because of that, he just, he sort of doesn't exist. Like, this is the weird thing. Uh, Matt Wyden and I were talking about this. There's something about when, like, when you suffer is when you actually start to, like, exist as a person. Because <laughs> right. when you don't, when you don't suffer, it's like, who are you? You just, like, stuff just happens to you. But then when, when you suffer, then all of a sudden, then there's a chance, like, to change reality and to, I mean, we... I'm monologuing, so you can break in and stop me at any point. But, uh, you know, it's like sick kids are such a great example of this because, like, sick again, to go back to kids, right? They're like, there's such a point of friction in your life. But as soon as you say, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to suffer this sickness and do what's necessary, well, then you've transformed that child's life, especially like, you know, say a very sick baby who's going to die without direct medical intervention. It's like the only reason that person continues to exist into the future is because you suffered because there was friction in your life. And so now all of a sudden you've got this, whereas like when things are going right, they kind of just go right and you're not really an agent in the world. Right. So there's this connection right. between like actually existing as an agent and suffering. Yes, the boundaries. So what we were talking about is when you don't have resistance, you can't find your boundaries because maybe you yeah. don't have them. And, so, and this is why equality doctrine is dangerous. It makes everybody the same but if you're the same, then you also do not exist. <laughs> I was like, we want equality. I'm like, you do not want equality. Because if you had equality, you wouldn't exist. Technically. That's a technical definition. It's also practically true, right? It's why it's why some people resist <laughs> communism, because they, they want to stand out. They want to be, they want to be someone important. They want to be different from other people. So you can't you can't claim uniqueness and equality at the same time. They're 
they're they're up uh, uh, certainly opposing in some fashion. You can't have a both. You gotta you gotta pick one. But it, but it is that training of the boundaries. But when there are no boundaries between you, right, where you end and other things begin, then you you don't you're not an agent for sure. I mean, you can't you can't move <laughs> things if you can't grab them. To, to quote, uh, is it Ronald Dasher Jr.? Um, when everyone's special, nobody is. <laughs> right. <laughs> also true. Yeah, it works on both ends of the of the equation. Yeah. No. Are you uh, talking about syndrome? Uh, from the Incredibles. Yeah. It's no. It's Flash. Flash. No, it's a syndrome yeah. line. It's is not it a dash? dash line. It's a syndrome line. It? Dashiell Roberts Jr. That's what it is. Dashiell Roberts. They Jr. might both say it, but that's syndrome's stated motive for killing. Yes. Yes, for, for that's right. His whole thing is he wants to make everyone no. Yes, I can't remember that movie's that, that's a wild movie. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Just there's there's something about uh, okay, the sense of what is that, what is that word? Maybe is it ennui? Is that the word that I'm thinking of? That sort of like listlessness. Yep, yep, that's ennui. Yeah, yeah. trust yeah. the French to come up with the perfect word for it. Exactly. Like, uh, what is it, uh, Father? Um, backdoor humor. What is it called? No, backstep the humor. Stairway wit. Stairway wit. Stairway wit. Wow, my my synonym dyslexia is going wild tonight. L'esprit yes. de, de l'escar. <laughs> yeah. L'esprit de l'escar. That sense of like that sense of ennui seems to be. Yes. Well, I mean, I you know memes are worth what they're worth, but are one of the ones that really stuck with me. Was a hilarious one that showed it. It was a picture of some Scandinavian village where everything's, you know, perfect and these brightly colored houses and in the, in the falling snow. And then the other one is this grimy Brazilian favela. And over the Norwegian one, it's or like it's like, you know, death metal about how life is meaningless. And then over the Brazilian favela, it's like me, all their music is upbeat about how life is beautiful, and love, and you know, and full of love and color and all this stuff. It's like. Yeah, but What's like the difference also... between having sunlight and not having enough sunlight. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I, I, I no, don't but, think but, it's but, any more complicated than that. But, but no, I think I think that's an interesting point. Like like pe people sort of long for in music, they long for the music of the poor class, right? Like that's rhythm and blues. Why are we copying rhythm and blues and turning it into rock? It's kind of a good question. Why are we doing that? Am I supposed to answer that? No, no. That, it's it's more something to think about. It's it's yeah. more rhetorical. Is that always been the case? But I'm like, but I mean, that is actually for the last hundred years anyway. It seems like those who are in a position of like ease seem to be incapable of producing music. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think that's always true, though. I mean, no, no, no I think that's it not is. always been true. No, no, it's it's the, the no. The problem is the, the for the general case that's true, and for the specific case, everything's irrelevant because there's too much Thanks, variance Mark. in the world. <laughs> well, it, it is well true. because yeah. yeah, because there's too much variance in the world. Like this is what people never account for, right? They that's why they go, oh, I found one outlier position, so your rule is wrong. Therefore, everything you say is wrong, and it's like that's yeah. the opposite of how the universe works. Like the exception proves the rule. Like the fact yeah. that. The fact that an exception can exist makes it a rule, not a law, or a natural law is probably a better way to well, say it. Like, or God's law. Yeah, it's like does does having unlimited resources make you undisciplined and crazy? And the answer is yes, it does. But that also doesn't disprove people like Elon Musk, who are like, and you know that other cadre of about a hundred insanely wealthy, insanely driven men who just like do crazy stuff. But like the vast majority of people with their resources would just go crazy. <laughs> pretty much like within a month as as can be demonstrated by with by the lottery right mm -hmm. because the lottery is a more even you're not selecting for a specific set of skill of character traits the way you are for like people who make billions of dollars in the tech industry because they're incredibly lucky and incredibly talented and incredibly intelligent and incredibly driven and like the vast majority of people who win large lottery payouts just lose all of that immediately like it's all gone and so i don't know that's interesting i'm just kind of like i'm, I'm using on all i guess maybe because it's the end of lint um 
you know, this role of like tough stuff. Like what is tough? What's, what's the good of things being tough for you? Andrew K has come to rebuttal me. No, no, probably not. Um, probably not. You've got a little bit of noise coming in, Andrew. So I, uh, I took the uh, initiative to mute you. Um, oh, Yeah, yeah. Hello. <laughs> there he is. Hey, we can hear you now. You're here. What do you have uh, to say about resistance? Uh, you get that in school, don't you? Um. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, all the time. And a lot of people feel adrift and lonely after they're done with school and like their life is no longer uh, going anywhere. So maybe that's yeah, and then uh, sometimes we do stupid weird. things like go to grad school. Yeah, I only went to grad school because I had to to be a priest. That's what high school sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I've got I've got a question for y'all. Do people do you think that most people still think that the realm of fairy exists outside of low Earth orbit? Okay, let's slow that down. Yeah, hit yeah. me with that one again. Most people thinks that the realm of fairy exists outside of low Earth orbit. So it's Past like low Earth we've, orbit, taken, yeah. we've taken all of the energy that used to go into fairy stories to seeing something strange in the woods, and now we've projected it into outer space sci-fi. Yep. Yeah, and actual space exploration and, Mar and like colonization okay. drives and things like that. Yeah. Um, that, oh, okay. Uh, so let, let me let me just cast this uh, differently because I have, <laughs> I'm still a little lost, but I want to make sure I gotcha. So, so what you're saying is belief in in something non-material or mystical, which is what you're calling the realm of fairies here, is inevitable. Well, fairy, not fairies. Fairy, not fairies. Fairy. What? Yeah. Sorry, we can talk about that distinction another time, Mark. But you're, yeah, you're, you're yeah. pretty I'll close to what I'm into that. I, I slipped up. I'm after. Yeah. No, no, I okay. slipped up, and I was like, "Oh no, <laughs> that was a bad mistake." Sorry. No. So, 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 what you're saying is that that mysticism has moved, you know, to the extra material beyond the orbit of Earth. Yeah, beyond low Earth orbit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sure. Y yeah, but yeah. You, you, right, because I was going to push back. And most people don't don't but I really there, wanted, but they do. I yeah. really wanted to discover that most people actually believe in like gin or genies that live just outside of low Earth orbit. That would have been Jerome. a way more interesting world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, push them away. Right, and then it and then it allows us to control our encounter with them, unlike we'll say the Irish story way, where the you can you can encounter a fairy at any time, right, and and you can I, encounter I, that I, mystical world, and, and yeah, because the it, government it, can't keep you from finding out about fairies. The elites don't want you to know this, but <laughs> the elites don't want you to know this, but the woods are haunted. <laughs> yes, you can just meet a fairy. That's it's well, strange. Yes. I do wonder Strange. if that also connects with the with like the general urbanization of humanity that we aren't in weird liminal spaces anymore on this planet. Yeah, partially. I don't know. No resistance. I I'm wondering control. now. You know, I've just come across a bunch of stuff. I was, I've been watching some stuff on um, some land restoration projects and forestry management and things like that, and I've just I've gotten a fresh dose of the. Um, like nature, nature is the realm of spiritual purity. Religion. Mm. That's a maybe weird one. it is pure, but it might not be purely good. <laughs> yeah, it's purely something, that's for sure. Yeah, purely but it's itself. Not, but but they think it's pure. They think it's pure materialism, right? Because it seems yeah. to re-enchant the disenchanted material that we create from it, right? But yeah. but it's. Yeah. But there's way more going on, and and they don't see it. Yeah. Do you no. think? Sorry, Emily, do you think that people think 
other people are more dangerous now because the woods aren't haunted. Like this, like it's getting dark. Be careful. Just gets completely pushed onto like anyone you meet in the mm-hmm. dark will kill you. I don't know. <laughs> like, so right over there, a block away, is a really trashy bar. And every Friday and Saturday night at 2 a.m. when it lets out, I get woken up by people hooting and hollering about something. And I'm glad that I'm inside. I'm glad that the doors are locked. And I hope that they stay out there uh, where they belong, hooting and hollering about something. (laughs) Um, So there is something to what your mother said about, you know, not staying out after midnight uh, because nothing good really happens. Um, Oh, my goodness. Which is one of those funny things where, you know, talk about efficiency, right, Mark, and like the need to levelize time, right? Because one of the things for efficiency is you want to maximize uptime, which this is actually a downstream effect of capitalism more than anything else. Because the because the more if you if you have an expectation on optimal return, cash return on investments, when you have infrastructure, you want that 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 has a function of like profit by uptime so say like a power generation system you want to maximize uptime on things right you bought that truck you want that truck to run as much as possible you bought you built a you know you built a generator you want it to run as much as possible and so there's this push like 24 you know you've built the factory let's put in the third shift right so we're getting away from we work when it's light you know and sleep when it's dark to someone's always working someone's running the night shift at the Mm. at the trash bag factory but we totally haven't gotten away from that. And like weird, weird stuff happens way more often at night than it does in the daytime. It just does. That's, that's like, true. It absolutely does. And right. and a, another funny thing is I was buying flooring for this house from this guy who, who sells, um, he just like retails pine flooring from a little mill in South Arkansas. And I was asking him about how often he sells through it. And he said, it goes, he sells it twice as fast in the summer as in the winter. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, it's indoor work. Like this is indoor flooring, but, for whatever reason, the economy picks up so much in the summer that he's like, right. more house renovations are being done in the summertime. And it's like, oh, so right. we're not away from these natural cycles. No, all that to say, no we're not. Right. We're not at all. Right. We're totally but, not but, at all. People make more stupid decisions at night. <laughs> right. Right. Well, we're, but, but we're tired. We think we can't be seen because we can't see. Right. So yeah, we're more likely to engage in bad behavior. Right. But, but, uh, but, but I, I want to push back on some of what you said. Ted. Like now, in in, in uh, they've they've actually kind of confirmed. Uh, back when when we were hunter gatherers, they there was shift work. Somebody had to watch the camp or the village. Oh sure. So, so sure. people were always doing that. I, I don't. Well, capitalism is is a bad is a bad term. See see navigating patterns. Uh, for what? But the type, but, uh, the quality of work they would have been doing would have been very different. They couldn't have a whole line of fluorescent lights turning the factory floor right. into daylight. So right. it it's would be different. They would just be having right. a vigil. That's right. It's that's right. It's different. It's different kinds of work at day and night. What I'm trying to what I meant what I yeah to be more precise. What I'm trying to say is it's it's a homogeneity. You do the same work at noon and at midnight at six in the morning at six in the evening, it's the same work all the way across. That's more important. Right. That, that yeah. you're removing, but you, but you never get out of the cycles. No. And, 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 and you can't, and you shouldn't like, you should embrace the cycles. Abs. Ab, yes. Yes. So to go, to go back to a couple of points, y'all said, you know, I was thinking about when I had that bear attack, the pigs. And I was like, I had all this insight into like, Oh, this is why people built walls around villages. This is why people stayed up at night. This is why they locked all the doors. This is, you know, this is why you, all this stuff. And it's for for 10 days. And I was out a lot at night in those 10 days. I never once noticed the stars. And it was only until the bear was dead. And then I was like, oh, there's stars. I haven't, I have, because in those 10 days, the only thing that the dark meant was there is a large creature out there that's going to kill things. That's right. That's and right. now I well, can't see it. That's relevance realization. Right? <laughs> that's the world is attention, right? That's yeah. all the same thing. I mean, that's because you're caught. You, you, I got to do a video on this someday. Cognitive overload's a thing, and you have a limited amount of cognition. And if you don't put it towards the bear, you won't be around. 
to and so us. we're trained to put it towards the most dangerous thing. And then when yeah. we don't have a most dangerous thing, which I, which I think has happened, right? The affluent mm -hmm. people don't have that, right? Their their most dangerous thing is the is the is the top boss in their video game, uh, right? It's their it's cars, the actually. Well, yeah, 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 actually, but 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 what happens is they lose all sense of boundaries and they lose all sense of importance which means all sense of hierarchy because importance and hierarchy are actually the same statement at some point, right? Or importance points at hierarchy. Yeah. Hierarchy is the thing that allows you to have importance, right? And apply it. So, so then they, they squish down yeah. the world. There's your flat world. That was my Friday live stream, by the way, navigating patterns, flat world. Uh, they squish down the world and, and yeah, now they don't, they, 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 but then they lose the sense of the poetic. And the next thing, you know, they don't come to Arkansas with us and have a wonderful time. <laughs> okay so this is just a plug for this when we were talking about hardship it was, it was like what was the other thing that was totally bouncing around in my head is another wonderful book i just read called the boys on the boat which is about the 1936 olympic rowing team from the u.s it was a boy a, it's a it's eight eight stroke it's a, it was an eight oar so nine boys because they got the coxswain and they're all just like these depression era like children of loggers and fishermen out of like uh the back country of washington um it's just such a fantastic story i highly recommend it and just in terms of like an appreciation for what hardship can do to people in a really really positive way as is a it's a beautiful book um at any rate sorry that had been tickling the back of my head for a long time and it finally finally came through um but yeah I mean, there's a whole lot of st this stuff you could take immediately and look at that and be like, yeah, they were. So for instance, the main, the main gentleman that the author follows, he was his, actually his neighbor. And then he finds out there's this incredible story. He'd already written a, several well-received nonfiction books, finds out that his neighbor who's dying of congestive heart failure had had this incredible story. Um, but I think when he was 12 or something, his father and stepmother and other siblings, uh, you know, the farm had gone just completely south in the Dust Bowl era and depression and everything. This is in Squim, Washington. And he came home from school and his parents, they're like, we're leaving and you don't get to know where. You can have the house. And so from like 12 on, I think it was either 12 or 14, he was just like, all right, we're like taking care of the chickens and we're poaching salmon and we're eating berries <laughs> and we're going to like earn 10 cents wherever we can. Um, and that, or that, there's just a lot of like, it's one of those weird things where it's like, I wish that on no one. And yet it just, you know, you know, for Joe Rance, it was completely transformative and like set his life in this beautiful, beautiful direction because of what he endured there. It's such a weird thing. Like suffering is so weird in that way. And it's like, I don't, I don't like, I actively seek to avoid it for my family. And yet it's also so, so transformative. But that was, why that was. That was the one church of the... gives you safe doses of suffering. Yeah. I was about to just try fasting today. See if you can manage that. That's like it, it's it's the appropriate dose because it's like you're choosing to do it. I I can't make you do it, you know. So you have to you have to cooperate with it. So it's voluntary right. uh, ultimately, and then it's like you 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 won't die. This is America. None of us are starving. Um, it'll actually be good for your health. To have a fast day, <laughs> I, I, you'll you'll be better after this, and um, and uh, yeah, but you know, it, you'll know what it feels like to be kind of hungry at three p.m. and um, and that'll be good for you. <laughs> yeah, well, that that reminds me of what Jonathan Peugeot said at Symbolic World Summit, right? Which is he said, "Oh, you know, my wife and I occasionally miss being poor because when we were poor, we had miracles all the time." Hmm. But the problem, mm, yeah. and then Sally Joe points this out, is that some people become embittered by the suffering. And so that's yeah. why you don't wish it for your children, because it's like, oh, this stuff is dangerous. You right. don't know what it's yeah. going to do inside of somebody. So um, right. that's... Uh, right. Yeah, random, random suffering for random people tends to cut one of two ways, and usually not for the best for most of them, right? Whereas suffering for, you know, for for you know highly religious people they tend to become saints so you know <laughs> must be something there somewhere i don't know
<laughs> yeah. Ah, yeah. it'll never come to anything. Well, yeah, speaking gotta get, of gotta... things coming, this mm. uh, this is going to come to the end here. This little live stream, um, because it's tired, and um, you know the 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 natural world has cycled towards dark and cold, and uh, I think I'm going to go to sleep. It sounds orderly. So, yes, it's a, it's it's quite orderly. Um, it's the way that's, God intended. It's what God wants me to do. God wants me to end this live stream. And that's who am suffering I for, that's suffering him? for the rest of us. <laughs> you could you could start your own live stream, Mark. This is right. You have the technology. You could do I it. Could. But all if I have Ed, to say if is Ed wanted me to, I would. That's for sure. If I could get him on. But what Father stream. says is what Father says is as a ge good German, it's 9 30 and so he's done. <laughs> oh okay. That's so fantastic. good night. And God bless you all. Night, everyone.